you need to use your chemistry hat and understand concepts like resonance, concepts like electronegativity, concepts like um, um, atomic radius, okay? Because that's what we're going to be looking at when we look at um, acid-base strength and what makes one acid stronger than the other. So let me go ahead and start here. Okay, characteristics of acid base and salt solution. And it goes back to our previous discussion of like barium fluoride. This is a salt. Remember that salt is a generic term for an ionic substance. That is, it has a cation and an anion. Of course, the most common salt that you guys know is table salt, NaCl. But you notice it has a cation and anion. So any chemical that has a cation and anion, we classify under the umbrella as a salt. Barium fluoride is a salt. Sodium acetate is a salt. Baking soda is a salt. Sodium bicarbonate. It's got a cation and anion. So all these are salts, okay? It's the generic term that we use in, in this particular discussion. So what determines the, the strength of uh, acids, for example? We have to look at polarity. And remember, polarity has to do with how distorted. If you've got two atoms and they have an electron cloud and one atom has a stronger electronegativity, Chi represents electronegativity strength, and this chi is a uh, 1.5. The, the atom with the stronger electronegativity is basically going to draw the electron cloud towards it, so the polarity is going to point towards the more uh, electronegative elements. So depending on the polarity of the chemical, that's going to affect the acid-base strength. The bond strength, that's the bond between two atoms, okay? How strong is that bond? And the bond strength is really influenced by the atomic orbital overlap. If there is good atomic orbital overlap, then that bond strength is pretty good. But if the atomic or orbital overlap is very insignificant because maybe the, the size are not compatible, then that's going to be a weak bond, okay? Solubility of the conjugate. Uh, remember that this is all going to be in water. So if the conjugate can be stabilized by the water coming in and stabilizing it because it can solvate it, then it's going to be a reaction that is favored. And the sol um, actually, that, that also goes for the salvation of the ions. We're looking at the stability of the conjugate and the salvation of the ions here. Let me just also mention that in terms of the stability of the, the um, conjugate, you're looking at resonance structure. And these are all concepts that we're going to be taking a look at shortly. Okay, so let me go ahead and clear that. A molecule will transfer hydrogen only if its HX bond is polarized towards the X. In other words, the electronegativity is going here, thereby weakening that bond right there. Um, weak HX bonds will lead to greater dissociation. What does that mean? This, by the way, is for that. Again, the weaker the bond, the greater uh, the chemical will, the, the more efficient the hydrogen will be released. Stability of the conjugate, well, the greater the stability of that, that ion that is formed, the more stable the products the more willing it's going to give up its hydrogen, the stronger the acid. And finally, I um, apologize for the fact that this is all, I guess when I put it on my iPad, the, the formatting is messed up. Anyway, the extent in which the ions are stabilized by water leads to stronger acid. So these are all properties we're going to take a look at to determine how or these are all properties we're going to investigate to determine the strength of the acids or the base. So in terms of this right here, acid, acid strength involves the breaking of HA. That's very critical. 
and the formation of HOH2. What I mean by that is this right here. When you break the HA, you've got an H plus, and the H plus wants to be anchored to water to form H3O plus. So that's what I mean by that. Uh, factors that affect the ease by which the bond is broken and the bond is formed. This bond forming is going to um, determine the strength of the acid. And again, I apologize for, for the, um, the rest of the sentence running down the margin. Okay. But that's basically what it's saying. Uh, let me clear this and then move on. So let's take a look at this, these acid. Remember I told you um, there are seven strong acids. And one of, among those sevens are the halogenated acid. And these acids were HCl, HBr, and HI, which is what we have right here. HF is not a strong acid, even though it's in that family. And the question is, why is HF not considered a strong acid, even though it's the same it, as, um, it's in the same family as the, the rest of these elements? And it has to do with bond strength. This probably has the strongest bond strength, and this has the weakest bond strength, okay? Um, if you look at these right here, again, we're looking at binary. We're looking at binary hydrides. So we have one element bonded directly to a hydrogen. If you look at these right here, and yeah, you might say to yourself, that's not binary. It's binary in the sense that there's only two elements involved, carbon and hydrogen. It's binary in the sense that there's only two elements involved of nitrogen and hydrogen, okay? That's what we mean by binary. It could have more than two, but only two different elements. So what we need to do is figure out among these series, this right here and this right here, which is the strongest acid and why? And what you have here is, I'm telling you here, it's the bond strength, here it's electronegativity. We know that fluorine, is more electronegative negative than sodium, which means that this is going to be, um, it's going to polarize that electrons that is shared between hydrogen to the fluoride, causing that to be weaker, okay? Here, the sodium and the hydrogen the electronegativity difference are not that huge. Therefore, that bond is pretty strong. That's why NaH, CH4 are non-acid because the bond between the carbon and the hydrogen or the sodium and the hydrogens are pretty strong, okay? Here, this is a pretty, it's an acid, not a very strong acid, but an acid nevertheless, just because even though it's a strong bond, it's the, the fluorine is more electronegative, and so it polarized those electrons towards itself. So let me um, do this. You can see that in terms of bond strength, HF is definitely stronger than um, HI. So therefore, this is your strongest acid. And in terms of electronegativity, fluorine is more electronegative than sodium. Therefore, this is among this family. This is your stronger, stronger acid. Okay, so I hope that that's clear. I want to discuss this further, okay, because it, it needs to be clear why the bond strength between H and F is stronger than the bond strength between hydrogen and iodide. If you look at the periodic table, hydrogen and fluoride, fluorine are pretty much the same size. Hydrogen's in the first period, fluorine's in the second period, but with so many protons, remember as you go across the periodic table, the atomic radius decrease? Well, because it's a smaller uh, ion, especially when you move the electron, that means when they bond, 
Hydrogen has an s orbital. Fluorine has one of its p orbital, but it can make it like that. And so what you have is compatibility in the size, okay? And if there's compatibility in the size, then there's good orbital overlap. And the good over orbital overlap makes that a fairly strong bond. On the other hand, if you have hydrogen and iodide, and I'm so trying to exaggerate this, okay? Because of the incompatibility on size, then the orbital overlap is very um, small, which makes that a very weak bond, which makes that a very strong acid, okay? But when you're comparing HI to HBr, HI is a stronger acid, HBr to HCl, HC, HBr is a stronger acid, and of course among the three, HCl is the weakest among the three, but in excuse me, in water, they all have the same strength. They're all considered uh, strong acid. Oops. And that's because of something called the leveling effect. Okay, and we'll talk about the leveling, leveling effect uh, towards the end of this discussion. But it basically tells you that since it's water, it all forms hydronium. And the end product hydronium is, since they're all identical and it dissociates 100%, that means that they basically have the same strength. But if you use a different solvent, you could actually see that HI is the stronger acid among the three. Okay, so. so the trend in um, acid strength going up and down the periodic table, you're looking at uh, orbital overlap. The better the orbital overlap, um, the stronger the acid. So the strength is going towards the bottom. Stronger acids are found in the bottom because better orbital overlap, okay? When you go across the periodic table, then you're looking at electronegativity. And that's because when you have stronger electronegativity, you get more degree of polarization, which causes the hydrogen um, the hydrogen bonded to the other element to be weaker, which causes that hydrogen to be easily come, come easily to come off. Okay, so in terms of acid strength, it goes from left to right. Stronger the acid on the right side, and, and again, these are for binary. Don't forget, this is for binary acids. Only two different types of element. Um, left to right, based on electronegativity. Uh, top to bottom based on atomic orbital overlap. So, okay, so here, here they are. Um, that's basically the, the justification. So let's take a look at oxy acid. Oxy acids are basically oxy ions. What are oxy ions? Oxy ions means that there are oxygen, hydrogen, and a third element, X. And that third element is generally a nonmetal. So here's the general formula of oxy acids. Okay. Um, you've got oxygen, oxygens hydrogens, and a third element. Examples of oxy acids are um, HNO3, which you see right here, sulfuric acid, phosphoric acid. Notice they all have the same um, elements. They have an oxygen, a hydrogen, and a third element that's a nonmetal. 
Compounds of hydrogen, oxygen, and third elements are oxyacids. So um, let's take a look at this series of oxyacid. This is your hypochlorous acid. This is hypochlorous. Hypo means lacking. That's what the prefix is. Don't mistake hypo for hydro. Hydro means hydrogen, but these are not called hydrochloric uh, acid, okay? It's hypochlorous acid. This is hypobromous acid. This is hypoiodous acid. And the reason why it's called hypo is because it comes from this family. This is H O C L H two. Sorry. H C L O two, H C L O three, and H C L O four. Remember the family of oxy acid. This would be the hypo. This would be chlorous acid. This would be chloric acid. And this would be perchloric acid. And the only difference between these are the number of oxygens. This has four, this has three, this has two, this has one. So you can have Hypobromous, bromous, bromic, and perbromic acid. Anyway, that's just a, a review because I know that maybe Chem 200 was a while back. So I want to always uh, mention this as I talk about it. That way, it's not something that you're searching for uh, uh, as I talk about them. Okay. So if we take a look at this, you're going to see that this part of the structure is all the same. The hydrogen oxygen bonds are all the same. So it's not going to be about atomic orbital overlap. Okay, that's a non issue in terms of the size because hydrogen is directly bonded to the oxygen in all these cases. It's got to be about the third element here and it's got to be about the polarization. How well does these, does this third element pull the electron cloud away so that as to weaken that bond? And it's based on electronegativity. So you guys know that in the periodic table, the most electronegative element is going to be on, on the top right corner. And we know that chlorine is closer to the top right corner than bromine, than iodine. So chlorine is the most electronegative among these. Because it's the most electronegative among these, that means that chlorine is drawing the electron cloud away from here. Okay, there's, there's electrons right here. It's drawing the electrons away, weakening that oxygen hydrogen bond to a greater degree than the iodine. Therefore, that chemical would be the stronger acid among the three. Okay, so you see how I'm, I'm trying to show you the chemistry behind this? based on what you guys should know, electronegativity and polarization. So that's that's what's going on here, okay? Um, here, I'm trying to show you that chlorine's more electronegative than iodine, and therefore, um, this is the more, this is a stronger acid. Here, again, we're going to see later on that we're going to look at the family of oxy acid, this has three, this has two, this has um, one oxygen, this has no oxygen attached to the chlorine. And because oxygen is very electronegative, three oxygens pulling on that those electrons is going to be uh, more polarized than two or one or none. So just based on that logic, this will be the stronger acid. Okay, so you don't need the Ka's, in other words, all, for a series of chemical in which the structures are very similar, all you got to do is look at the, chem the, the chemistry, look at what's different, and then based on that difference, come up with the conclusion that, that yeah, it's going to be more polarizable for this chemical rather than this chemical.
So uh, let me uh, move on from here. And that's what we see right here. We can see that the Ka's for uh, hypochlorous is three times 10 to the minus eight. The Ka, Ka for hydro iodous acid is 2.3 times 10 to minus 11. They're both, they're, all three are weak acid, but among the weak, this is the strongest. This is the weakest. And you can say the same thing among in, in this whole series as well, okay? So again, this is trying to show you what's going on. This is H-O-I. The electronegativity is drawing that electron cloud away. And the chlorine, because it's more electronegative, is drawing a greater amount of the electron cloud, therefore weakening that bond to a greater extent than the iodine. Okay, so hopefully that, that makes sense in terms of uh, what you guys see here. Okay, um, so this is just the mechanism that, that I already explained in, in our previous discussion, but I just want to spell it out in this particular slide. Okay, let's take a look at other oxy acids. Okay. Uh, Again, yeah. Let's take a look at other oxy acids. This right here. Remember, oxy acids has oxygen, hydrogen, and the third element. And in this particular case, uh, variation on the identity of the third atom. That should be the third atom. So when you change this right here, let's say we have HOCl and HOBr. We already talked about this. It has to do with the electronegativity. Here we have sulfur and selenium. You guys know that sulfur is closer to the top right corner. It's going to be more electronegative. This chemical is H2SO4. Four oxygens two hydrogens, one sulfur. This chemical is H2SeO4. H2SO4 is a much stronger acid. In fact, it's one of our top seven, just based on the fact that even though these two have very similar structure, sulfur is more electronegative than selenium, okay? This is the Lewis structure for both, and definitely H2SO4 is a stronger acid because it's going to have um, the sulfur is going to be drawing the electronegativity away. And then the oxygen is going to be drawing the electronegativity away even, even further like that. Variation on the number of oxygen. We already talked about that because you have more oxygens pulling away at the electron. Here, you only have one oxygen here. You have two oxygens, thereby weakening the hydrogen-oxygen bond. This is your stronger acid relative to this right here. So H2SO3 is a weaker acid than H2SO4. Just because this only has three oxygens, this has four oxygens. Okay, so... That's what you see right there. Variation on the number of oxygens. I already said that. Here is the evidence. When you have one oxygen, you have a pKa of 7.5. When you have two oxygens, you have a pKa of 2.0. Remember, the smaller the pKa, just like the smaller the pH, the stronger the acid. And the reason why that's the case is because this right here tells you that your hydronium ion concentration is one times 10 to the minus 7.5. This tells you right here that your, your hydronium ion concentration is one times 10 to the minus two. 10 to the minus two is a bigger number than 10 to the minus 7.5, okay? That's why a smaller pKa means stronger acids. 
Here, we don't even have a pKa for this uh, chemical because it's one of our stronger acid, strong acid. We don't, we don't have a pKa for that. And this actually has a negative pKa, okay? Negative means that the concentration of the hydronium for this particular chemical is greater than um, one molar, okay? It's like three molar, five molars. Whenever you get a negative pH, the concentration of the hydronium is greater than one molar because one molar is 10 to the zero. I want to, for those of you who are going on to organic, this is a special case of what we call uh, carboxylic acids. This is the carboxyl. Okay, the carboxyl functional group. And these, is, these are class of organic acids. Um, carboxylic acids are a large category of organic acids. These acid contains carboxylic groups, this right here. Uh, carboxylic groups contain the acidic proton. This is the hydrogen that comes off. Um, and again, notice how it's attached to an oxygen, okay? And so if we take a look at some examples of carboxylic acid, acetic acid, formic acid, benzoic acid, they all have that same structural motif, but the element here is going to vary. For acetic acid, we have a CH3 group. For formic acid, we only have hydrogen. For benzoic acid, we have a benzene ring. And if you look at the pKa, we have 4.76 here, we have 3.74 here, and we have 4.2 here. So among these three acids, this is probably your strongest acid, followed by benzoic acid, followed by acetic acid. So this is your first strongest, and you know it's the strongest because it has the smallest pKa value. This would be the second, and this would be the third, just based on pKa value. Um, so let's go and investigate organic acids further. You know that methanol also has an oxygen hydrogen bond, except methanol has this type of structure. Let's compare methanol, the acidic properties to acetic acid. These are the structure. Methanol is actually not a very good acid. Okay, it's not a very good acid. And the reason why it's not a good acid is because if that oxygen comes off, then that oxygen is going to be without the hydrogen and then you can't stabilize it any further. Unlike this chemical, if that hydrogen comes off, you actually get resonance structure. Hopefully you guys remember this from Chem 200. And the resonance structure is going to be, let me erase this so that you guys can see, is that right there. The, whereas methanol has no resonance structure, acetate, this is called acetate. It's the um, anion of acetic acid has a resonance structure. Because it has resonance structure, it remember the more resonance structure a chemical has, this is from Chem 200, the more stable that particular um, chemical will be. Because it ha can do resonance, it's going to be stable. So therefore, the, the product that forms when it, when it delivers its hydrogen is actually somewhat stabilized by the resonance structure, okay? Um, but again, these are organic acid. You can actually get something called a trifluoroacetic acid. And trifluoroacetic acid means that all of these hydrogens are replaced by fluorine. And you guys already know fluorine is the most electronegative element. And so imagine if you had three fluorines over here, all pulling at the electrons from that OH group. Well, you guessed it. You, what you have here is something called a super acid. The electronegativity domination from this CF3 group is so strong that this class of chemical is called super acids and they have negative pH, okay? 
So when you get, we don't really use trifluoroacetic acid much. We don't even use uh, chloroacetic acid. In fact, chloroacetic acid was one of your unknowns for experiment number five, but we took it off just because it's not a very safe chemical, okay? Um, it's a very, very strong acid. And so we don't, we tend not to use it unless you have some purpose in mind for using that particular acid. But we try not to use these super acids. So this is a summary of acid uh, trend. Uh, make sure that you remember these are binary acids where you're looking at uh, bond overlap or atomic orbital overlap. You're looking at electronegativity. Those are the two main criteria. In terms of oxy acid, you're looking at electronegativity. Uh, you're looking at, you're not looking at atomic orbital overlap. You're looking at electronegativity, you're looking at resonance. And even though we haven't said it, um, but over here, these guys can actually be stabilized by water because water is partially positive and partially negative. So the salvation of these chemicals are, are actually um, pretty good. And so it stabilized the products. That's basically what I'm saying. So in terms of, um, in terms of oxy acid, you're looking at electronegativity, resonance, and solvation. Solvation is just, has to do with how water stabilizes the product, okay? So that takes care of that particular topic. Um, Without looking at KAs, if you've got a series of chemicals and you're trying to predict which is the stronger acid or which is the weaker acid, then just based on the structure, you guys should be able to figure that out, especially if you're, you've got binary or oxy acid. The other hint I want to remind you of is that sometimes the question is not about which is the stronger acid. The question might be, which is the stronger base? The way you determine which is the stronger base is you make the base the acid. And you know how to do that because weak base all comes from weak acids. It's the conjugate. And then what you can do is you can figure out among the series, which is the stronger acid? The stronger acid is going to be the weakest base. So if I gave you a series like um, OH2, let me uh, clear this out. If I gave you a series of the following, let's say I have HPO3, um, HPO4, and I ask you, among the two here, which is the stronger base? What you want to do is say, okay, what's the acid of that? It's H2PO3. What's the acid of that? H2PO4. Between these two, which is the stronger acid? Hey, this one has more oxygens. Therefore, this is a stronger acid relative to this because it's going to have um, more, the, oxy, the four oxygens going to be tugging away at the hydrogens to a greater degree. So this is your strongest acid between these two. That means that this, between these two bases is going to be the weakest base, which makes this the stronger base between the two. Okay, so Rather than try and figure it out based on the base discussion, look at their conjugates. Figure out between the conjugates which is the stronger or weaker acid, and then go back to its conjugate because the, the strongest acid will be the weakest base. The weakest acid will have the, stronger, the strongest base. Okay? It's the conjugate effect again. So that's one way of, of using this knowledge to now 
be able to to um, quantify or categorize among acids and bases which is the strongest which is the the weakest if you're given a series hopefully that makes sense okay the next category that I'm going to be talking about and this is probably the last category for this case is salts we already talked about salts BAF2 is a salt and AACL is a salt but as I said in the previous discussion, when you put this in water, sometimes the solution will have a pH equal to seven. Let's say we're at 25 degrees, okay? Because if we're not at 25 degrees, then the pH will not be at seven. We have a pH of seven. If you put that salt in, sometimes the pH is going to be less than seven, which makes that, that solution acidic. Sometimes the pH is going to be greater than seven, which makes that solution basic. So the question is, what salt causes the solution to be neutral, won't affect the pH? What salt will cause that solution to be acidic? And what salt will cause that solution to be basic? And the um, answer lies on the ions that make up that salt, the ions. See how you have a salt here? You have a cation, and an anion that's what makes up the salt when you put it in water these things separate based on the solubility and what you need to do is you need to investigate these cation anion and see if they're conjugates of weak acids or weak base if they are then they're going to have pH influence. If these ions are conjugates of strong acids and strong base, then the pH will be 7. It's not going to have an effect on the pH of the solution. It'll remain the same. Okay, so let me uh, um, try and elaborate on this. Okay, there was a question here. Um, more oxygen, so stronger acid, acids, so weaker base, yes, exactly. Um, from uh, Lee, if you have a series of acids and they all have the same similar third element, they all are phosphorus, they all are, are, are sulfur, they all are chlorine, okay? So the only difference is the number of oxygens. Then yeah, the more oxygens you have, the stronger the acid. Its conjugate therefore will be the weakest base and therefore the, um, you can you can figure out the the series of bases okay so there was also a question from emma strong acids and strong base have ph of seven no no that's not what i'm saying i'm saying that the salts from strong acids and strong base have a ph of seven strong acids and strong bases do not have ph of seven strong acids will definitely have a ph much much less than seven strong base would have a ph much much greater than seven and let me try and explain to you what I mean by conjugates of strong acids and strong base here. Okay, so thank you for paying attention. Sometimes it's very difficult because I can't see you guys. And so I can't see whether or not you guys are understanding my words. And so I'm just talking blindlessly until I see a question pop up on the chat room. So please, if there is questions, let me know that way I, I, I know that you're listening and you're trying to process the information and hopefully I can clear that up, okay? Because it's, it's definitely weird talking to my iPad and uh, locking myself in my office, in my house. So anyway, um, let me go ahead and talk to you about this slide right here. So salts from strong acids and strong base. What is an example of a strong acid and a strong base? A strong base would be like sodium hydroxide. A strong acid might be HCl. So what are the salts that com are coming from this guy? The sodium would be the cation. The chloride will be the anion. So the salts that comes from a strong base and a strong acid would be NaCl, okay? When this goes into the solution, you get the sodium ion, you get the chloride ion, okay, you get the chloride ion. But see what happens is that these guys will not react with water 
to form NaOH. Okay, it will not react with water to form NaOH because NaOH by definition wants to stay se separated. So that reaction doesn't go. That's the definition of a strong base. It wants to be dissociated. Chloride is not going to react with water, okay, to form HCl. Because again, by definition, strong acids will dissociate and not recombine. So therefore, since these ions have no, it's not going to react further with water, it's not going to cause hydronium or hydroxide to form. That's why the pH stays the same. So salts that comes from strong base and strong acids will give you neutral solution. Okay, and you guys already know the the seven strong acids. And you also know that bases with OH, especially group one, are strong base. So let's take a look at the second category, salts from strong base and weak acid. So a strong base might be sodium hydroxide. Okay, that's, that's that. And then a weak acid might be HF. So what's the salt that forms? You got NAF. The sodium is not going to react further with water, but the fluoride, because it's the conjugate of HF, is going to be a base. That's a base. Remember when we talked about BAF2? Well, BAF2 had produced, um, was influenced by hydronium and hydroxide. Well, the fluoride will react with water to form hydroxide and HF. So this salt will cause the solution to have a pH greater than seven because the solution is going to be basic, okay? Again, it's all in the chemistry. So you really need to understand your chemistry to kind of like see how these things operate. And it's acid-based chemistry. Sodium is not going to react with water. You got to understand that fluoride is the con conjugate of HF. Therefore, it's a, a weak base. And as a base, it wants to pull hydrogen from water. And in the process of pulling hydrogen from water, it produces hydroxide. It makes the solution basic. Let's take a look at the next one. Salts from weak base and strong acid. So weak base might be like NH3, okay, NH3. Um, NH3, the salt from that would be NH4 plus, okay? So that would be the cation portion. This is the cation portion. And then a strong acid might be something like HI. That's a strong acid. So the anion portion would be I. So the salt that you're talking about is NH4 plus I, okay? So if we have this salt in water, what's the chemistry? NH4I will dissociate to NH4 plus and I minus. But I minus is the conjugate of HI, and you guys know that's a strong acid. So it's not going to react further with water. So there's no reaction. This guy is not, the iodine is not going to give you any other complications. The ammonium, however, is a weak acid. And you guys know that from what we've talked about previously. This in water will cause, it's gonna donate the hydrogen to water. You get hydronium and you get NH3. Yes, NH3 is a base, but the main chemical is H3O plus. It forms H3O plus. So this solution is going to have a pH less than seven because this solution is going to be acidic. It's going to be acidic because the NH4 is going to react with water and form hydronium. Okay, so that solution will be acidic. This solution up here I told you is going to be basic. This solution I told you up here is going to be neutral. Now what happens when we have a weak base and a weak acid. Let me clear this for you. Well, we have a weak base and a weak acid. We might have something like NH4F. This comes from NH3, which is a weak base. And this comes from HF, which is a weak acid. So the salt that you have is NH4F. 
that's that's a species well this is the compl the complicated among both salts what you need to do is you need to look at this reaction let me uh, try and write that more clear um, you have NH4 F your first reaction is NH4 plus water goes to NH3 plus H3O plus. You guys should know because you're forming H3O plus, that's a Ka. The second reaction is F minus plus water goes to HF plus OH minus. You guys should know because it's forming OH minus, that's a KB. So the quick and dirty way to figure this out is compare Ka to KB. The value that's bigger will dictate whether the solution is acidic or basic. If this Ka is bigger than that KB, then the solution, this reaction dominates, this equilibrium dominates, it's going to be acidic. If this Kb is bigger than that Ka, then this equilibrium dominates and it'll be basic. So if the question is simply, is the solution acidic or basic? Find the Ka for NH4+, plus, find the Kb for F-, minus. look at their size, look at their value. Even if you have the pKa, you can do that justification. And whichever dominates, you can say that's what's going to be running the show. So you don't have to do the complete calculation. In other words, it shows you how important the K equilibrium, the Ka, the Kb are to each other. Okay, that's that's basically what why we I emphasize that back in equilibrium because it gives you a lot of information. So. Let's uh, kind of look at this real quick. This will be the summary. So this is basically what happens here. I told you it was going to be pH 7. Here, I told you it was going to be greater than 7. It's going to be basic. Here, I told you it's going to be less than 7. And here, you have to work out the problem. Okay. And here is a summary of what's going on, why it has no effect, because the ions do not react with water. Remember, water is always a solvent for all of these things. And it's the water, that's why we have a range of pH 0 to pH 14, because it's the hydronium and the hydroxide that plays a role in acid-base chemistry. Here, what we have is that the anion produces hydroxide because the anion is a base and that makes the solution basic. Here, the cation produces H3O plus. And the cation is a acid. In fact, they are weak base and weak acid. And that's why the solution is below seven. And here, you have to work something called hydrolysis. The hydrolysis is basically how both ions cation and anion reacts with water. The cation is going to give you um, a basically a Ka value. The anion will give you a Kb value. So you compare Ka and Kb to dictate what the pH will be for that. Excuse okay. me? Yes. Um, how would you calculate the pH when you have those values? Would you like subtract one from the other or? Yes, you would. You calculate the hydronium, you calculate the hydroxide, and then depending on which one is bigger, that's going to be the excess. And you subtract the smaller value from the bigger and whichever remains is going to be your dominant chemical, either hydronium and hydroxide. And if you have hydronium, you can calculate the pH. If you got a hydroxide, you can calculate the pOH. And if you subtract 14 from the pOH, you got the pH value. Um, I have a question regarding the, the take home um, problem you gave us. I think it has something to do with this as well. Um, yeah, it does. HCO3 in it, which could be 
um, an acid or a base, right? So would you compare the K and KB for that and then subtract the two? What, what chemical did I give you? And um, uh, NaHCO3. NaHCO3, yeah. That one has two equilibrium. Remember that the sodium is a spectator. So it can either pick up a hydrogen through water and form H2, CO3, or it can donate a hydrogen to water and form CO3 minus two. So in one case, if it donates a hydrogen to water, it's going to form hydronium, right? So you're looking at the Ka for that. So would you subtract the, would you subtract the Ka and the Kb? Yeah, no, you, oh. you, don't, you can't subtract Ka's and Kb's, they're not. You have to calculate the hydronium ion concentration for this reaction. And here you have to calculate the hydroxide ion concentration from that reaction and then figure out which one's bigger. And as a shortcut, you can do this. Hydronium equals the square root of the Ka times the initial concentration of the bicarbonate. Okay. All right. Okay. Here the hydroxide is going to be equal to the square root of the Kb times the initial concentration of the bicarbonate. That way you don't have to work through the ice table. If you just go straight to that, it'll save you so much time. Okay, thank you. Okay, once you've got the hydronium and the hydroxide, look at which one's bigger, subtract the smaller quantity from the bigger quantity, that'll determine uh, the chemical for that and then you can calculate the pH or pOH. Okay? So, um, in fact, this example right here is very similar to that. Let me clear this. Okay, I'm sorry, I'll use this page as my, as my scratch paper. But this is very similar to that. It's called hydrolysis because you have, whenever you have hydrolysis, it means that it, the, the chemical itself, the, the end product of the, the chemical, and this the end product here, ammonium and fluoride, is reacting with water. So hydrolysis simply means a reaction with water to form some product that influences the pH of that solution. So when you have ammonium fluoride, look over here, you can see ammonium producing, and again, this will be in the same light of what you, what you just asked. See how ammonium produce hydronium? Well, instead of doing all of that, just go straight to, to, to this. You know that the concentration, I already calculated the concentration for you is 2.0 molar. So here, you know you've got hydronium. Hydronium is going to be equal to the square root of um, two times 5.56 times 10 to the minus 10. So if you look at my, my computer, well, if you look at that, and let, let me just bring this up. Uh, if I have two, and I multiply that by 5.56 to the negative 10, okay? And then I take the square root of that, I get 3.3 .3 times 10 to the minus five. So if you look at that right there and you do the ice table, 3.3 .3 times 10 to the minus five. So it's a shortcut. I teach this to my analytical chemistry class. And so I figured that you guys, if you understand the ice table, you need to understand the ice table before you can commit to this because the, the, the chemistry is in the ice table. This just takes basically the, the summary of the ice table. So for, for the hydroxide, the hydroxide likewise is going to be the square root of two because that's the initial concentration. Okay, it's going to be two for both because when you have 37 grams of ammonium fluoride in 0 0.50, that will be the same amount of moles because it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So the concentration of the ions are both going to be two times Kb and the Kb is 1.47 times 10 to the minus 11. So if you work out that math, you guys can try that. I won't do it because I'm, I'm, I'm losing time here and I wanna get done in another five minutes, okay? But if you do that math, you actually come up with this answer. Now, take a look at this, because I think it goes back to that question you were asking. You've got both of these chemicals. Which one is the greater quantity? 
that's the greater quantity. So you know, first of all, the solution is acidic. Okay, you know that without even doing a calculator because you've got, this is a higher concentration than that. Well, take 3.3 times 10 to the minus five, subtract it from 5.42 times 10 to the minus six, and that excess, so let me go ahead and do that in my calculator here, okay? 3.33 to the exponent five, and then subtract 5.42 to the exponent six. And what I have is my hydronium ion excess is going to be 2.7 eight, eight times 10 to the minus five. And so that's acidic. And then if I take the negative log of that, so I'm just gonna take the negative log of that, okay? And I see that my log functions here. I have a pH of 4.555. Remember I have, actually I only have two significant figures. So it's 4.56. This number of significant figures is after the decimal point, okay? And so let me just show you that answer real quick. Here it is, 4.554. Well, I rounded off, but that's how you would solve that problem, okay? So um, look at this problem. This is the solution to, to this problem. This is just a, a in-class problem that I would have presented, but these are all the answers. Okay, if I gave you um, 3.95 grams of sodium bicarbonate, this is, a, this is a very complicated problem. Why? Let me go back. Because ammonium will give you hydronium, but bicarbonate will give you both hydronium in one direction and hydroxide on the other. So this is as complicated as you get. If you can master this type of problem, then you'll be able to master acid-base chemistry, okay? Uh, because this is, this is a, a very complicated problem. But anyway, these are the um, answers. And again, take the shortcut. All these have Ka's that are very small. So always use the shortcut, especially if you're pressing for time because it will save you time, okay? So I'm gonna stop there. Um, I'll talk about the leveling, leveling effect next time. Okay, this right here, it basically tells you that when you're in water, the chemical that's produced is hydronium. And because all those strong acids produce hydronium at 100%, they all have the same strength. You can't say in water that HI is a stronger acid than HCl because they're going to basically do the same type of chemistry. How you can tell is by putting it in a different solvent. That's what the leveling effect is. So let me take a look in the chat room, the chat, and see that you guys have any other questions. Do you have a worksheet or practice problem of these types? Yes, there, there's a whole bunch of questions in the practice session, uh, the practice exam. So um, you can take a look at that, and I think I mean, if you can do this problem right here, this problem right here, then you, you'll be able to master most of the problem. But a good, a good example is if I give you different salts, you should be able to tell me whether that, that salt's gonna make the, sol the water solution acidic, basic, neutral, okay? Uh, you should be able to do that. That's basically our discussion. If I give you a series of acids or a series of base, you should be able to Tell me which one's the strongest, which one's the weakest. Um, I think strong acid, strong base and water gets hydroxide. Strong base plus water gives you hydroxide 100% of the time, yes. So the pH of that solution will always be greater than seven, yes, okay? So if you have a strong base like sodium hydroxide or calcium hydroxide, what happens in the influence of water only, that will always dissociate because these things are soluble in water. The hydroxides themselves don't react with water. They just dissociate, okay? So there's no chemistry involved. 
That's what makes these chemicals strong bases because what happens is they spit out hydroxide and hydroxides are, is what determines the pH. Remember, the, the bigger the hydronium, the smaller the pH, the smaller the hydronium, that means the bigger the hydroxide, the smaller the pH, the bigger the pOH. So there's an inverse relationship. You might think of this as a teeter-totter pH, pOH. When it's balanced, they're both seven. But when this is 14, this is zero. When this is zero, this is 14. So you can think of pH and pOH in, that, in those terms.